We'll remain standing for the gospel reading coming from Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 11. And it reads, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. Ah, so here we are. We are starting a new sermon series this month called The Unholy Habits, otherwise known as The Seven Deadly Sins. So I'm going to be addressing or attempting to address the subject of lust. So we tend to have a narrow view or narrow reference for lust because normally it is only in the context of sexual desire. And although this aspect is true and it is important, it is not the only side of lust. The word lust in and of itself is not inherently a bad term, though it has negative connotations. Lust means to desire or long passionately for. That is why I love the cartoon series SpongeBob SquarePants. How many of you have watched SpongeBob? That is my show, okay? (laughs) I give full revelations based upon that show. Uh, So we know that the main character, SpongeBob SquarePants, is overly passionate about everything. Whether he's excited or sad or angry or expressing any other emotional component that he is comprised of, you know exactly what he's feeling. Theologians and scholars go back and forth between whether pride and lust uh, are trying to determine which one of those is the fundamental component Um, that sets the foundation for the rest of the sins. But I'd argue to say that they are actually, that they actually go in hand. Where there is pride, you will find lust, and where is lust, there is also pride. And so I wanted to show a cartoon clip from this show because I think it heavily demonstrates the uh, example of what lust looks like. Replacement spatula? How could anything ever replace? Hey, look at that! Whoa! Whoa! Looks fancy. Sounds charming. Oh, the wine's so sleek. What am I talking about? I don't need this. You don't need this. I would give serious consideration to a replacement spatula. Oh! Uh-uh. No, touchy, touchy than a spatula. It's very, very expensive. 
Well, I'm sorry. Of course, if you purchase this fine item, you may hold it. Well, I've got some loose change in my pocket. Will this cover it? Um. No. How about now? Well, now. 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 Now can I buy my spatula? Everything, huh? Nice outfit. So I show this clip because we notice uh, the context within this within this particular clip. Uh, SpongeBob ends up selling everything he has, including the clothes off his back. Uh, to pay for a spatula um, that has all the extra features. And if you keep watching it, it's a, it takes an interesting turn of events because the spatula ends up uh, developing human-like characteristics. And he punches SpongeBob in the face, the spatula does, uh, and runs off because he can only be used for fine cuisine. Some of us, we would call that bougie. <laughs> and so with that, the spatula actually grows legs and ends up running away from the restaurant. And then he makes this, this profound statement that we all come to, to recognize. He says, all that glitters is not gold. And so the thing that he lusted after turned on him. So with this perspective of lust, we tend to only discuss it in one facet, but it can be attributed to many other aspects of our life, including materialistic, uh, including food, or, or any of, of our physical needs. And so that brings me to the text. In our text, Jesus goes into the wilderness and he deals with these temptations. Temptation is necessary testing that we must endure because it is the Holy Spirit who is the master teacher. And if that be the case, it is unfair for a teacher to test you on information that you do not have. Authority belongs to those who can pass the test. So at the end of the third chapter, we see a prophetic demonstration, even an ordination, uh, when Jesus comes to get baptized. After he was baptized, a voice came out of heaven and made a specific de declaration to Jesus. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This statement spoke directly to the identity of Jesus because Jesus had not done anything spectacular. He hadn't performed any miracles. He couldn't start, he couldn't take off dancing nowhere because uh, it proved nothing. But what we find here is a miraculous statement for him to address his identity because it's going to be necessary while on his journey to purpose and it was necessary for the process that he was about to walk into. Now here is where the master teacher who is Holy Spirit comes in and he leads Jesus into the wilderness. The wilderness, it means a place of abandonment. This is important because in order for you to be able to lead, which is the job of our Christianity, you must first learn how to be led. And for every year that the Israelites were in the desert, Jesus spent one day. And after his fast, the text tells us that he was hungry. And then the tempter came to him. Because any time you make a decision to follow God, the devil is going to come with all kinds of distractions. His most frequent distraction that he uses is the power of lust. But before I go there, Satan calls into question the identity of Jesus. 
after God just got done saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, the devil brings this statement into question. And he says, if you be the son of God, this is because it has been Satan's strategy since Genesis with Adam and Eve. Satan tried to question the authority of God's word and also the authenticity of his character. How does this help you? When it comes to process, you need to look back at what God has spoken over you. And where do we find that? We find that in God's word. So he looks Jesus right in the face and says, if you be the son of God, command these stones to become bread. The first temptation that Jesus encounters is the lust of the flesh. So we as humans have diverse kinds of cravings and, and appetites. When you are hungry, you begin to lose some aspect of your sobriety. That is why it is said not to go to the store when you are hungry. You can laugh because you know you did it. I did it yesterday. I went ahead and got my pack of Oreos. <laughs> and because in addition to what you originally came to the store for, regardless of that particular point, you no longer are leading by what you originally came in for, you are being led by the cravings that come from your stomach. At least I know that's the case for me. And all of my Target shoppers know exactly what I'm saying, so you can say amen right there. <laughs> so Christianity is not a one-time decision that you make when you come to this altar, but it is a daily decision. And if this be a daily journey, then you must address your hunger. The lust of the flesh, it is anything that satisfies any of our physical needs. In your temptation of your hunger, you will be tempted by what you consume. For everything that takes place in the natural realm, there is a spiritual connection. You cannot allow yourself access to any and everything because not only do you have access to it, but it has access to you. For example, I can come in those double doors and leave those double doors. So not only do I have access to the World Wide Web, but the World Wide Web has access to me. And so, what you put in is essentially what you're going to pour out. For example, if all I eat is junk food and unhealthy things, eventually my body is going to react on the outside because of what I have taken in on the inside. The same applies to spiritual principles. If I don't cultivate my relationship uh, with God and my community, my church, God's people, I will not have the, I can't be surprised when my own personal growth, physically, mentally, emotionally, and every aspect that is comprised of me, it begins to suffer and it becomes very difficult to live in. Jesus gives the premise on how we deal with this kind of lust. He says, you can't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It matters to you and it matters to God what you're consuming as it pertains to natural desires that we have, but also it matters what we feed our spiritual being. Jesus understood that you cannot fight a spiritual war in the flesh but it is the purposes and the counsel of God that always prevails. The devil came to him again because once you're facing temptation, it doesn't just come once, but it comes multiple times. And he took him to the highest point of the temple and told him, throw yourself down. And then he began to quote scripture to support his own personal agenda. This type of lust is called the pride of life. This kind of lustful lifestyle deals with desiring or loving anything of this world that leads to arrogance and pride of self, where we become our own source of maintaining a lifestyle. 
putting ourselves above God. And then again, Satan used scripture on Jesus. And he says, throw yourself down for it is written, you, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up with their hands lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus responded with, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Daring Jesus to throw himself down was to get him to prove that he was indeed the Messiah and that God had to save him, though that was not part of the will of God for Jesus at that time. It has been debated that, these tempta that this temptation motivates the other two types of lust because it involves putting self before others in, in, an, in an unhealthy manner. He basically tries to entice him by saying, surely God will come to the rescue. He basically says, go ahead and have a little fall. God will forgive you. In this generation, we would like to say, only God can judge me, although that is the gospel according to Tupac Shakur. So then, here we come to the third type of temptation, the lust of the eyes. The devil came to him again and took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And we notice in this text that there is no point in the text that Jesus argues this point of fact, whether or not Satan actually had this to give. And so this is why it is important to seek the will of God for you, because the first trap of this, of this discussion is that Satan wanted to remove Jesus from his process and into purpose, but he wanted to do it prematurely. Eventually, all power was going to be given to Jesus, but not before he was ready. He had to endure the process so that he would be able to maintain what God was going to give him in the future and eventually have the authority to give us what was given to him. Lust is a matter of the heart. I can tell who or what you worship based upon your deepest desires. Jesus wouldn't bow to Satan because his heart desired to please God. We must make a daily decision to choose God over our own lusts, over our own desires, over our own opinions, even over our own political leanings. And I know it got quiet on that one. <laughs> so today you may feel as though you are in the wilderness, the place of abandonment, but this is actually the place of redemption and transformation. You might be in a season where it feels like you are surrounded by so much darkness that you can't see because our fleshly desires can become so overwhelming with temptation. But I want to encourage you that because we have faith, if there, if there are unholy and ungodly desires, then there must be godly desires to counteract it. And that is what we must pursue, the godly desires uh, that, that apply to God's heart. They must become our desires. The psalmist wrote, Satan, the so Lord Jesus. <laughs> the psalmist wrote, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And God is not just looking for us to be good people. He is looking for us to be a changed people, a transformed people. And every single day, as, as we meet our own lust face to face, we have to make, make up our minds that we are going to choose God and we are going to choose God all the way. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent, and everything in between, my desire is to please God. 
The songwriter said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And Joshua would have said, as for me in my house, as for everything that is attached to me in my household, every person that I come in contact with in my life, we will serve the Lord. When lust temptations arise, you have to have, and it is written, come out of, out of your spirit. Some of us lose battle because we don't have enough to say. Sometimes we lose because we don't have an idea of what God has for us. Uh, we don't have, we don't connect with our, our spiritual identity enough. We connect with our humanness so much so that it causes us to lose sight when we are in the wilderness, when we can't see and we feel like we're groping around in the dark. We don't know what we're looking for. It is in those places where we have to seek God ourselves and say, God, I need you. And so you are not the only one in this battle of lust by yourself. This is why the church and your community is necessary for your journey. And at some point, you have to be honest and say, God, help me. I think I have a heart problem. Sometimes you have to go into a place of hiding where nobody else can see you, where you are alone with God and say, God, I need you. I think I have a heart problem. Sometimes you have to become undignified. And David said, I can be more vile than this. But God, help me. I think I have a heart problem. And once you confess that to God, you've got to go to your spiritual community or someone who knows how to intercede on your behalf and say, help me, I think I have a heart problem. People that won't judge you or, or mock you because of the state you're in. I believe in God, but I also believe in my therapist. It is essential that we find connection and community in our, in our relationships so that we do not battle lust alone. Sometimes you have to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and just say, I believe God. It doesn't have to feel like it's true, but that doesn't make it any less true. It's the truth whether we feel it or not. God does not change his mind about us even when we feel like we are changing our minds about ourselves. And after all these temptations, the devil left him. But once the devil left, somebody else came into play. The angels came and ministered to him. And there's one more aspect. There is another character in this text that many people don't address because we read so fast. Not only was Jesus talking to Satan, he was talking to himself. Because you've got to come to a point where not only are you confronting the things in front of you, but you have to confront you. Lord, you're going to have to help me because they ain't saying nothing. And that's the point where we have to say, I believe God. No matter where I'm at, no matter who's in front of me, no matter what's in front of me. And so, these unholy habits. We may have a, a passionate longing for them, but as we get to know and develop our relationship with God, we, uh, we unlearn the unholy habits and we begin to pursue the things of God. We only rely on God to help us through the process of transformation. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message. May it reach the hearts of your people. May it reach every darkness in, in our lives. This is not just the message for to get us through the week, but I thank you. This is uh, a prophetic declaration for each and every person's destiny in Christ Jesus. Help us to keep fighting when we feel lost. Help us to keep pushing on when we are in the wilderness. And we will be ever more careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.